minutes, that's where we'll be starting from, page 13. If you're new or you don't have a storybook yet, you may turn to Genesis chapter 12, and our key passage today will be verses 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, or page 13 in your storybook. And uh, I also just found out when I was in the back that uh, Corey Gallardo's grandmother passed away this last Wednesday. So if you would be remembering the Cox and Gallardo family, I know they would appreciate that very, very much. I want you to think in your mind of people you know who have had a grand vision for their life. People that you've rubbed shoulders with, that you've read about in history books, that when you think of a grand, big vision, they come to mind right away. As I thought about this this last week, I thought about the Wright brothers, who had a vision that man could fly. That's a grand vision, let me tell you. I thought about Steve Jobs, coming up with the Apple computer, running head on into IBM, all right? Everything was against him. And how many of you in this room have an iPhone or an iPad? Raise your hand. Look at that. A grand vision that got off the ground, all right? How about Martin Luther King? Jr., he had a different kind of vision, a different kind of dream, where one day people would be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. They all had a grand vision. But with every big vision, there are some serious obstacles to overcome. For example, with the Wright brothers, there are obvious external obstacles to the whole idea of people flying. I think Steve Jobs had obstacles to overcome in getting Macintosh and Apple off the ground. But I think the vision that Martin Luther King Jr. had was a far tougher vision because it didn't deal with externals. It didn't deal with outside elements. His vision fundamentally required a radical change on the inside of people. The way in which we think and believe and choose to act, and that's the toughest kind of vision to achieve. So with every great vision, there are great obstacles to overcome. With every obstacle to overcome, there must be a great plan to achieve the vision. If there is no plan, then we would have to ask, how are we going to tangibly accomplish the vision? And in some ways, you might be able to say that what you call a vision Possibly it's not really a vision at all. It is just a dream. And there's nothing wrong with being a dreamer. There's nothing wrong with thinking big. We have no reason to be disappointed then when those dreams don't become reality. How many of you have had dreams that were nightmares? <laughs> you certainly don't want those to become reality. How many of you have had dreams? You thought, wow, that would be kind of cool if it happened. You know, I dreamed once I was rich. Say? I dreamed once that I married a beautiful woman, and it happened. It happened. And I got to tell you, I didn't have a plan, all right? I had no plan. But, but I ask you a question today. What is your vision? What is the vision you have? What are the obstacles that are facing you in achieving and accomplishing that vision? What is your plan to overcome those obstacles and accomplish that? Do, do you have one? And if you don't have one, it might be okay. Maybe your vision is just a dream. God has unfolded for us in his scriptures, in his story, a big, gigantic vision. We saw it last week when we opened up to chapter 1 of the story. God's big, gigantic vision simply is to be with us. God wants to hang with you and with me. We saw last week how he created the heavens and the earth. We saw how he created the, the, the animals that roam the land and that swim in the sea. We saw how he hung the stars in space. He placed the sun and the moon. But his number one vision, the pinnacle of his creation, was you and me. Adam and Eve, the only ones of all of this creation that have the thumbprint of God on them. You are made in my image. There is going to be something different about the way that you and me 
relate that God and the rest of creation. The community of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit dwelling with the community of His people who are made in His image. And this is how it started in Genesis 2 when He created Adam and Eve. And do you remember last week the scripture said, And God came and walked with them in the cool of the day in the garden of Eden. God loved hanging out with His people. If you have the story Bible, Last week, you remember, we opened up to the map in the cover of the Bible. This is a, a map of the Old Testament Bible lands. And we showed you last week where the Garden of Eden was likely to have been placed. If you go up from the Persian Gulf, you see where the Tigris and Euphrates River branch off into two rivers. And right there in the crescent of those two rivers, just below where it says Ur, you are the name of the city, that is the area where most believe the Garden of Eden pre-flood was to be found. And if you go right on up that valley, stay between the rivers, get up there, go up above Nineveh, just a hair, and right in the middle of that valley, why don't you, uh, oh, I'll take you to do that later. No, no, above Assyria, <laughs> above Assyria, to the right of uh, the Tigris River, we had you draw a boat. Remember that? That was Noah's Ark. That's where the mountains of Ararat are. And that's where the boat landed. All right? And last week, down there where the Garden of Eden was, remember I had to draw a figure, all right, of a tree, you know, and put some apples on it if you want to, just to reflect the Garden of Eden. So the Garden of Eden down here, Noah's Ark landed up there. Today I'm going to have you come to a place in that same valley again just in a little while. That area is now known as modern-day Iraq, by the way. We also learned in the story, message last week, that there are some huge obstacles that emerge right after creation and also right after the recovery of the flood. You see, out of the free will that God gave to us as people, the first two people, Adam and Eve, did not choose to align the vision of their life with the vision that God had for them. Has that ever been you? Adam and Eve very quickly said, we're going to go our own direction. You see, God does not hold a gun to our head and force us to submit to Him, to have a relationship with Him. He gives us the freedom to choose. And when Adam and Eve were faced with that choice, they chose a different vision than the vision of God. And as a result, God's vision has been tainted. It's been ruined. Sin, that word all of us hate, sin now enters into the nature of people. By the way, what is the single vowel and the middle letter of sin. Say it out loud. I. Oh, he just admitted to it. <laughs> See, sin now enters into the nature of people, and sin is all about I. It's all about me. And it's that sin nature that separated us from God. It's that sin that banished us from the Garden of Eden. It is that sin that removes the tree of life out of our presence. It is sin that introduces all sorts of evils and sickness into our world today, and it's eventually sin which causes every one of our deaths. So the question then becomes, what is God's plan to get us back? You say, well, does He even want us back after all that we did? Have you ever thought that about some of your friends or family members? They've done you wrong, they've kicked you to the curb, they've gossiped about you, they've spread lies, and you've said, I don't care if I ever see or speak to those folks again. God could have felt that way. Does God want us back? And the story is a resounding yes answer from God. He wants all of us back. So what's his plan? Well, last week we saw, as we were winding up chapter 1, that the first plan involved the flood and Noah's Ark. We saw that it didn't work. Because that particular plan did not deal with the root of the obstacle, which is the sin in us. God wiped out all the wickedness on the earth, but he did not wipe out the wickedness that still resided in a righteous man's heart. Noah. And not long after he got off the boat, Noah overindulged in worldly pleasures. And the scripture said he ended up naked and ashamed, vulnerable just as Adam and Eve had been in the garden when they blew it. Now, did God know that the plan of a worldwide flood was not going to accomplish His purpose? 
Yes, he did. He's God. God did not do it to prove to himself that it wouldn't work. God did it to prove to mankind that man, out of his own efforts, cannot be changed by outward circumstances working in. We must be changed from inward decisions working out. It's about a relationship with God. We learn clearly from this event that in order for us to get back with God, it's going to take something beyond ourselves. Because we in and of ourselves are unable to get out of the mess that sin has produced in the world. That's what we learned from the story of Noah and the ark last week. So does God say he's going to give up on us? No. no absolutely not. In the spirit of Winston Churchill, God can be heard saying, he never will never give up on us. And you and I scratch our heads and we wonder, why not? The answer to that is the Tim Tebow world famous passage. This generation is going to know John 3.16 by Tim Tebow. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loves. That's the reason he didn't give up. So the main idea for today is God is going to build a new nation to reveal himself and his plan to get us back into a relationship with him. So let's look at the people that God chooses to start a new nation. Today, in chapter 2 of the story, we're going to see that God is going to unveil this new plan. Unlike the flood, which was a short-term plan, it happened very quickly, 40 days and 40 nights and about 150 days for water to subside, and we were all ready to start fresh again. Short-term plan. This time, it's going to be a long plan. He's going to start from scratch, building a new nation. Now what can he possibly be thinking when he starts a new nation? Before we get to the particulars of that story, let me give just a summary statement of what God is up to and why he's going to start this brand new nation. It is through this new nation that he'll reveal himself and his plan to the rest of the world to get us back. And that's the big idea for today. You see, at this time, in Genesis 12, where we're going to be starting which is in chapter 2, there are already other nations that have emerged since the Noah's flood. You can read in Genesis 11, which is in your regular Bible, that was not included in the story, but in Genesis 11 you'll have the story of the Tower of Babel. You see, what happened is the descendants of Noah, from Ham, Sham, and Japheth, they all started having kids and having more kids, and, and here's the deal, nobody wanted to move. They all wanted to stay near their family. They all wanted to stay near their friends. And so you've got, a, uh, you've got a Las Vegas springing up, okay? And everybody's staying there. Nobody is moving out to better. I mean, let's be honest. Las Vegas is pretty ugly. And they didn't have lights. And they didn't have the theaters. And they didn't have the shows. It really, it, if you could just stay indoors, Vegas is wonderful. If you ever have to get outdoors, it's a pigsty. All right? It's Gene Spurley's favorite town. <laughs> Here's the deal. The bigger and bigger the battle got, the more independent the people came. And they got this grand idea in battle that they could build this tower that could reach from earth to heaven and that they would be God. Humans trying to be God. And so the scripture says in Genesis 11 that God came down and he said, I'm going to disperse the people. And what he did is he confused their languages. That's where, that's where all the languages came from. Hebrew and Greek and Latin and whatever the languages were. It, he came and so what you did is you, you went around and you went, Abdelkumahanana. No, you don't understand that. But you did. Okay, you come with me. And so all the guys who spoke the same language, they went off and they started their own countries. They started their own nations, all right, based upon the language that they spoke. So that's how we have nations when we come to Genesis 12. They already exist. And God says, in the midst of these existing nations, I'm going to start a brand new one. And it's out of this new nation that I'm going to reveal myself, not only to the people who will be part of that nation, but to all the other nations who are looking on, and they also want to know God's address. And they want to find out how they can have a relationship with Him. 
they're going to be able to observe God's intervention and activity, and they will understand and know the true God and his plan to redeem them. That which was lost by the freedom of choice in the garden. Now with that said, let's dive into the particulars. The first question is, who was God going to pick to start this new nation? He created Adam when he wanted to start a world. He selected Noah because he was the only one who found favor in the eyes of God. It says he was a righteous man. What's the criteria God going to use to start a nation with? Let me ask you a question. If you were to start a nation, what would be the criteria? What would, what would be the job description of the traits that you want for somebody to start a nation? Would it be Columbus, who was adventurous? Would it be George Washington, who was brave? Would it be Ben Franklin, who was smart? Who, who would you pick to start a nation? Well, he chose a man by the name, according to chapter 2, named Abram. And as far as we can tell in Scripture, Abram doesn't even know who God is yet. Abram's father was not a believer. More than likely, Abram was not either. He hasn't been introduced to the God of the Old Testament known as Yahweh yet. So he's not necessarily godly in his relationship with God because in all likelihood, he knew nothing about God in his lifetime. Was Abram chosen because he was a strong leader? Maybe, but it's not recorded to us here. It, it's not evidenced in the criteria God used. If you go to Genesis 11, you will surmise that the primary criteria God used to select Abram and his wife Sarah to start this new nation is, are you ready for this? They were old. Yes. Any qualifications? <laughs> they were old and barren. <laughs> Have you ever seen that printed out on a job description? I'm looking for somebody old and barren. That appears to be what God has done. She had not had any children and could not. So we see that God selects a man named Abram. He's 75 years old. His wife, Sarai, is 65 years old and they're childless. I don't know about you, but this is rather humorous to me. That God, who knows all things, who has the pick of the litter, selects a guy that's 75 years old to start a nation with. And on top of that, his wife can't have children. And probably at the age of 65, she doesn't want to have any children. <laughs> what we're going to learn through this is that a common pattern of God, God seems nearly always to pick the least likely person to succeed in his kingdom's work. We're going to see it today. We're going to see it throughout our study of the Old Testament. And we'll see it throughout all of the New Testament as well. God often picks the most unlikely candidate in order to succeed his cause. Why? Because this enables people, other nations, other individuals to understand when they see great things happen through these people that it wasn't the person who pulled it off. It was God in them. This is God's purpose in starting a nation to begin with. The goal of God is the people to see him and know his plan. Now that gives many of us, or it ought to, a great deal of hope today. When you think of yourself, do you think you're overqualified? Do you in the marketplace? Do you think your resume is strong enough to accomplish what you want to do? When you think of yourself as a student in school, do you think, what am I going here for? I'm smarter than all these people. As it turns out, we learn in God's kingdom that this might put us in the best possible decision, position for God to pick us to do one of his projects is that we are not able. And I find great hope in that. I wouldn't be here today if I was personal talent, personal abilities, personal intellect. So the who of God's plan to start a nation is Abram and Sarah. The second question, what is God's plan? In Genesis 12, turn there if you will, please, page 13, all right, page 13, Genesis 12, this is how it reads, and the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Now, go back to your map for just a moment, back to your map, all right, you see the little town of Ur down there near where the Garden of Eden was, all right, that is where Abram and Sarai started out with Abram's father, all right, and then if you go right up that valley to just above Nineveh. 
of it, but stay between the rivers, right in the middle of it. Why don't you pencil in uh, and write out the name of another city called Haran. H-A-R-A-N. All right? Right in the middle of the top of the Tigris Euphrates River. If you look to the left, look at where the little peninsula point sticks out over there in the Mediterranean Sea. And go straight across and up just a hair in between the two rivers. All right? I know it's kind of hard to see way back there. But that's Haran. That, that, that's important because God tells Abram to go south to Jerusalem. You can't go south to Jerusalem from Ur. Okay? So he goes from Ur to Haran and then from there south to Jerusalem. All right, now we've done our uh, we've, we've done our map work today. This is the first time that we know of Abram audibly hearing the voice of God. A God that, as far as we know, up to now, he never knew. A God that he had not grown up with. The first thing that he tells him to do is to pick up, leave his extended family, and start walking south. I will show you afterwards, after you take off, Abram, I will tell you where to land. For many of us. That's the problem with our relationship with God. That is why it doesn't function all that well. You and I in the 21st century, we want all the details before we move. But in our relationship with God, it often requires a faith to hear His voice, believe, step out, after we take off and trust, and leave everything behind. God says, I'll begin speaking to you about where I want you to land. As Abraham takes off, then God reveals to him in the remaining verses here of chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. In these verses, God reveals to Abraham a fourfold plan that comes to be known as the Abrahamic covenant. It's a fourfold plan, and here's how it's spelled out. All right, uh, verse 2, first part of the plan. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I don't know about you, but if I was Abram, I would like the beginning of this plan. I like this. I mean, first of all, yeah, I'm going to make you a great nation, but, but who's going to make it happen? Does, is, does God give to Abram any, any demands or requirements? No, God says, I will make of you a great nation, and on top of you being a great nation, I, the Lord God, will bless you. That's an awesome first step. Now, yeah. little language up here. The Hebrew word for the phrase, wait a minute, is the Hebrew word, yo. <laughs> now, you will not find this in our English translation. It just doesn't work real well. But in the original Hebrew, Abraham actually responds to this in Hebrew, and I've translated it for you. It goes kind of like this. Yo, God, I think you picked the wrong guy. You're going to build a nation on me. I am 75 years old. My wife is barren. And God says, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I will build a great nation of you. I will bless you. Okay? God moves on to the second part of his plan. All right? Uh, next part of verse 2. God says, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. First, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Second, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing to other people. Now, again, you don't see it in the English, but it's right there in the Hebrew. Abram responds, Go, God! You're going to make my name great? <laughs> well, my name isn't Joe, down at the local McDonald's. <laughs> you see, the name Abram means father. And we see, just a quick digression, that in the New Testament, you and I are told to call God Abba, Father. Abba means dad. Abram is now going to be known, he's already known as Father. And Abram says to God, you're going to make me, whose name means father, a great name, and I don't have any children. People laugh at me already. It doesn't hold God back. God goes to the third part of his plan. All right? Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. God says, Abram, I've got your back. Not only will I make you a great nation and bless you, not only will your name be great and you will bless others, but those who bless you, I am going to give blessings on them. Those who curse you, I am going to sick them. God has his back. <laughs> Side note, don't want to get too caught up in all this. But ladies and gentlemen, that's why you and I as a nation, we better always, always be looking after Israel. I realize we're in a different period of time. 
they are still the nation that got started by Abram. And God says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. I don't know about you, I'd rather stay on the blessing side of that equation. <laughs> Abraham responds again, go, God! That sounds pretty good, actually. I mean, how would you like that? People will get to know me because of how I treat you and how we work together and how I treat them because of you. The whole purpose of God blessing Abram and cursing people who curse Abram is so that they will get to know the God behind Abram. So they might trust him, see his plan, and ultimately by faith turn to a relationship with God. The fourth part of his plan. latter part of verse 3. And all people on the earth will be blessed through you. Abram says, go, oh God, one more time. I want to believe this, but help me out here. I can't see it from where I'm sitting. All, every single person on the planet is going to be blessed through me. That's a pretty overwhelming vision, and it seems absolutely impossible from where I am right now. Of course, Abram doesn't know it, but in terms of blessing all nations and all people, God is ultimately referring to the one who will be born out of this nation, the one who after his birth would be wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. The one who 33 years later would walk the hill of Jerusalem. <coughs> we call it Calvary. And die on a cross for us. Who would be placed in a tomb and three days later be raised from the dead. He is the one out of this nation that blesses all nations. Let me pause just before I go on. Because I know some of you take pastors very, very seriously. For those of you who do, I want to back up and apologize that I sort of deceived you a little bit a minute ago. Yo is not in the Hebrew Bible at all. <laughs> and it's not in the English Bible either. In fact, Abram just sat and listened to these promises that God gave to him. And then in chapter Genesis chapter 12 and in Hebrews chapter 8 of the New Testament, and you'll find it recorded on page 14, the very first sentence on that page, you'll find in the story how Abram responded to all this. By faith, Abraham was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, though he did not know where he was going. All beginnings have turbulent times. Creation did, the beginning after Noah's flood did, this new nation. It's going to have some turbulent times. Abram took off from the land of Ur, and it says he made his way to a town called Haran. It's there that Abram leaves his father and his extended family, and God says, it's where I want to take you. It's south of here. Start walking. And when you get there, I'll tell you that you found it. How many of you would pack your bags, get in the car, and take off, believing that God's going to tell you, stop when I say stop? I doubt if any of us would do that. Abram did. And he walks down to Canaan. And that's where God says, this is the place I will give to your offspring. It's important to notice, as the story unfolds in weeks to come, that God doesn't say to Abram, this is a place I will give to you that will be your possession in your lifetime, but this will be a possession of your offspring. There's a reason for that. We'll get to it more later, but may I remind some of you who know the old hymn, it's tied to this concept. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. When angels beckon me, and I just forgot the next line. If you haven't joked with me, yeah. I won't be at home. I won't be at home in this world. world anymore. This was never designed to be our eternal home. So Abram went to a place that God was going to provide. It would be a place his offspring would enjoy. But even in that, it would never be our eternal home. Now there's a lot going on in the story. We don't have time to talk about it all. That's why I hope you read it the week before you come. That's why I hope you get the small group and discuss some of the questions in the back of the Bible. It's why I hope you will come on Wednesday night and we can address some of the other questions. But right now I want to cover what I think is the big picture. Make some observations about some important points. In order for this, Abram and Sarah, to become a nation, they must first have a baby. Isn't it interesting how it always starts with a baby? And yet they don't have one. If you see Abraham and Sarah standing up on a podium saying, I want to introduce to you the nation of Israel! Sarai, Abram. That's all, folks. That's it. they got to have a kid. Genesis 16.3 tells us that Abram and Sarai have been living in the land of Canaan for ten years and still no child. Ten years have passed.
passed. They're 85 and 75. No child. So Sarah thinks to herself, from human logic, maybe we've misunderstood God's plan. Beware of that thought. It leads to trouble. And so Sarah begins to think, maybe God needs my help. <coughs> Ouch. Whenever we say that, we're about ready to make the biggest mistake of our life. <laughs> God does not need our help. He wants our availability, but he doesn't need our help. She says, maybe, Abram, we misunderstood. Eve said to Adam, maybe God didn't really mean. Sarah says to Abram, hey, maybe, maybe I'm not supposed to have a child, but you're to be its father. So she comes up with this idea that was appropriate for the culture of their time. If a woman was barren, she could tell her husband it was okay for him to sleep with her maid. And then they could have a baby, but it would really be the husband and the wife's baby. So here's Sarah, 85 years old, her handmaiden, about 40 years of age, half her age, and she goes to her husband and says, hey, Abe, I can't give you a child, so why don't you sleep with my, my really young maid? And you know what? Abram does not give one word of resistance or complaint. <laughs> He's all for it. And Abram and Hagar have a son. Abram is 86 years old, and they named his son Ishmael. You will see in Genesis 17, 20 and 21, page 16 of the story, that God comes to Abram and says, I am going to bless Ishmael, even though this is the act of the flesh, even though this is the best that a man can do on his own. I will make him a great nation, but he's not my plan. He's not the son of promise. The son around whom we're going to build the great nation is not Ishmael. The son that will be a great nation out of your loins is going to come from the womb of Sarah. A son from an old, barren womb now is a foreshadowing of a son from a young virgin's womb later. That which is impossible, miraculously becoming possible. And the story immediately fast forwards 13 years. Just skips right over. 13 years pass and Abram and Sarai still have no children. Some of us give up on God after a week of praying. God, I told you, change my life. You've done nothing. Fooey on you. This has been almost 25 years. God says, I'm still going to pull this off, just like I said. I probably would have done it sooner, but you fooled around with my plan. Now listen to this. God is going to change Abram's name. He's going to change his name from Abram to Abraham. Abram means father. Abraham means father of many. God's going to change his name to fa his father, and he's already not living up to it. He's going to change it to father of many, and he still has no children. Wow. Can you imagine the laughing at McDonald's now? God is going to change the name of Sarai to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. Most scholars believe the slight change means her name goes from meaning princess to queen. You can imagine at 99 and 89 years old saying to God, we already have a hard time living up to our names. I have to deal with the fact my name is Father, and now I'm a father of many, and now I know, God, I know I'm a princess. I can see it. God, I, I am a princess, but Queen? Queen Latifah? That's too much for me. I can't handle it. And God says, no, I want to change your name. From now on, people refer to you not on what you were able to accomplish, but on what I can accomplish. Father of many, Queen of nations. Now, the next part of the story is not covered in the storybook. It's covered in Genesis 18. God sends his visitors to Abraham. They're angels and believed to be one of them, the pre-incarnate Jesus. And they come to Abraham and they tell him, this time next year, you're 99, Sarah's 89, this time next year, you're going to have a baby. Sarah's in the tent, eavesdropping. She's got the glass up to the canvas. And she hears what's told to her husband. And do you know what she does? Let me put it this way. If you were 89 and you heard the news that next year at this time you're going to have a baby, what would you do? You're going to cry or laugh. Sarah takes the positive approach and she laughs. Well, sure enough, one year later they have a child. Abraham's 100. Sarah's 90. And they have a child in the name of Isaac. You know what Isaac's name means? Laughter. <laughs> he was named after what his mother did. 25 years after God first comes to them, the vision comes to pass. Names are important to God. They depict something significant that's gone on in their life. Now the story continues by simply saying that sometime later, God comes again to Abraham. Many believe that sometime later is probably another 12 to 14 years. 
Isaac is probably in his early teens at this time. Abraham's probably 112 to 115. Sarah's probably uh, about 102 to 105. Optimal years for raising a teenager, right? <laughs> in Genesis 22, the text reads, God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, this is page 19 in the story, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Now, some of you have been around the scriptures a long time and you are familiar with the story. Others of you, this is your first journey through the scriptures and you're saying, something's wrong with this picture. I'm just an average young. I'm honest with you. I read this plan and it seems to be insane. Abraham and Sarah wait 25 years to get the first child and then 15 years or so later, God wants the dad to take the son out. Not only is this an unreasonable request of the father, but it really seems to wreck the plan. <laughs> I mean, if Abraham takes out Isaac, it's likely he's too old to have another child now. Is this nation that God is going to build really going to become a reality? Notice what Abraham decides to do. Something different than even Adam did regarding something different than Noah did after the flood. He decides to submit and obey God. There's probably not a man or woman in this room who would carry out that plan. Remember, he's had some experience of not paying attention to God. Hagar and Ishmael was the evidence of a plan gone bad. Now, we don't see this in the Old Testament text, but in the New Testament, in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, it is found on page 20 in the story. It gives us Abraham's thought process as he makes his way to the mountain of Moriah. This is what he says. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who would embrace the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, and it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. <coughs> Abraham reasoned that God, listen to this, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham had come into such significant belief and trust in God. He said to God, I don't understand how this works, but I've trusted you. You have kept your word. I will do what you ask. And he takes his son up the mountain. By faith, Abraham knows that it's God's reputation and it's God's word on the line. And Abraham ties up his son, puts him on the altar, begins to pull back the knife to take his son's life. When the angel of the Lord interrupts, tells him to stop what he's doing, look over in the bushes on the side of the hill, and there find a replacement sacrifice for his son, a ram that's been caught in the thickets. Abraham and Isaac come off that mountain together, and Isaac grows up. Isaac gets married to a gal named Rebecca. Now listen to this. Maybe you caught it and you're reading the story. They are married 20 years before they have their first child. There's a little something with the productive organs in this family. I mean, this nation building thing isn't getting off to a great start, is it? We now have a handful of people, a perfect setup for God to display his power. He loves it when all the odds are against him because that's when people see God. Isaac and Rebecca, after 20 years, they have twins, Esau and Jacob. And as we will find out next week, Jacob will have 12 children. This thing is finally on the move, man. Twins! So God builds a nation in chapter 2. The reason for this nation is very clear. He's not just doing something because God likes something to do. He has an intentional reason in doing it this way. It's through a new nation that comes out of Abraham and Sarah that he will build his plan to get us back a relationship with him. Just like we saw last week in chapter 1 of the story, there are some clues deposited along the way in the Old Testament that give us insight into what God's plan is. So that even a person who does not have anything but the Old Testament, like the Apostle Paul, can know and learn clearly what God's plan is. We talked about one clue last week that when Adam and Eve realized they were naked, out of human effort, they made big ways to cover their nakedness. God came along and said, you are so inadequate to cover your nakedness. And God slew the end, and he provided skin coverings for their nakedness. Noah's sons walked backward into the tent of their drunken father to do what? To cover up their nakedness and vulnerability of his act of sin. That was the clue from last week. There are clues in today's message. Maybe you caught the similarity of the language in Genesis 22 with John 3.16. 
Genesis 22, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and sacrifice him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Are you seeing a parallel? There's another clue. Maybe you've not seen this before. I, I alluded to it Easter, I think, last year. God told Abraham to take Isaac to the hill of Moriah and sacrifice his one and only son on the hill. Do you know where the hill of Moriah is located? 2 Chronicles 3, 1 tells us through geography, the hills of Moriah are right there at Jerusalem. It's in that same hill region, possibly that very same hill, that 2,080 years later, that God's one and only son would be offered as a sacrifice, as a substitute for you and for me. The ram, without spot or blemish, now going to the place where a nation almost didn't get off the ground. And 2,000 years later, the one who will bless the entire world through that nation is crucified for our sin. Some of you have been to the city of Jerusalem. You know there's a Muslim mosque there called the Dome of the Rock. The Muslims believe that Abraham sacrificed Ishmael there. A little revisionist history work going on. They built a gold dome temple over a rock and they believe that Abraham sacrificed Ishmael. Jewish followers of Christians believe it was Isaac. It's according to the scriptures. But it's right there in the heart of the city. 2,080 years later, Jesus Christ will be sacrificed on the same hill. Could anybody, if they want to see, not see the clues? The plan of God is all right here in the Bible. God has a big vision and a serious plan to overcome the obstacles of our sin. And that plan includes you and me. God wants to come and be with us. Just like he did with Abraham and Sarah. He wants you to know him and have a relationship with him. Just like Abraham and Sarah. He wants to give you a purpose and a plan for your life, just like he did for Abraham and Sarah. He wants to give you a new name, just like he did with Abraham and Sarah. When you came in, or while you were sitting down, we gave you a white piece of paper. I asked you to write your name on it. I want you to get that piece of paper out and send it over to the blank side. As we wrap up the service, I want to give you a chance to ponder something and think about something. Because of what God has delivered you from, where God has taken you to, or because of some real transformation that God has done in your life, what do you think God would like to name you today? If God were to change your name today, what would he call you? When we're born, our parents give us a name, except for the O'Brien. <laughs> As most of you know, my parents gave me the name Timothy. <coughs> That name, if you look it up, literally means honoring God. I don't know if my parents knew that, but they named me or not. I can tell you it was a tough name to live up to as a teenager. I wish my name meant something else. I mean, many times in my lifetime, my name should have been changed from honoring God to stubborn Roland, impatient Roland, dull of hearing Roland. Maybe the best one would be annoying Roland. But I have walked with Christ for 50 plus years and he's changed my story, he's changed the direction of my life. I thought about this all week and if I had to pick a name based upon my relationship with God and what he's been doing in my life and decided that my name should be changed, it would probably be Challenger. It's who God has called me to be. Face the challenges I put in your world. Help others face the challenges this world puts in their life. So my new name is Timothy Challenger Roland. Kind of has a ring to it, doesn't it? If you know Christ, based upon your relationship with him, what is the new name that's given to you at this point in your relationship? Maybe that name's defined by where you've been or where you are, but what would it be? Think about this new name based on where you are. That chosen, forgiven, humble, restored. Maybe there are some other names, even though you have a relationship with God. You haven't fully captured His vision for your life. Maybe it would be lazy. Maybe it would be obstinate. Maybe it would be forgetful. Maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with God. You're honest enough to admit that. Maybe your name is Seeker, Hunter. Think and ponder about the new name that God has given you. What is your new name? What would you like it to be? Based upon the story that God is unfolding in His story. 
what would he like your new name to be? Would you stand with me as we close in prayer this morning? Your Father, your scripture says that when we become your child, you write our name in the Lamb's book of life, forever etched in your history. When you wrote our name in your book, what does it mean? We come to you this morning, and Father, I trust many of us are absolutely captured by the incredible unfolding of the story. We are reminded that as you were dealing with these people in the Old Testament, that we are characters today in this very same story. And just like you intervened for Abram and Sarah, you want to intervene and be active in our lives today. You want to know us. You want to hang out with us. You want to be the influencer of our life. You want to show us your plan. You want us to participate in a life with you that carries out your plan. And it's not too late. Abraham and Sarah thought 25 years and 100 years of age was too late. Father, I pray out of a spirit of worship and dependence upon you that there'll be a desire in us to know you and ponder what our new name should be. And so, Father, we think about these things as an act of worship and tribute to you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Guys, have a great afternoon. Thanks for being here.